Today in Game Changer, I'm really excited to be speaking to Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm is one of the world's most successful authors, most talented writers. He's an intellectual adventurist. He basically gets you to question everything that you thought was normal or that you thought didn't need to be questioned. He looks at things from a completely weird perspective and is able to link things that you never thought were linkable together. I love his books, I love every single article that he's ever written and I urge you if you don't know his work, which if you don't then you need to, but go on to gladwell.com, check it out, there's just phenomenal mind stimulation there. Um, he's a great storyteller and he goes into a lot of detail about that. I ask him a question in here about how he would change the, the school system or education and you can see the passion that coming through from him. He, on, on top of it, he's just a really nice, humble guy. I really enjoyed talking to him. Got a lot of respect for him. Um, and this, this interview is just filled with a lot of great wisdom um, and insights from him. Usually we summarize the, the, and, and do highlights of the interviews. There was just too much in here that was great, so we didn't. So watch the whole interview. Let us know what you think of, about it. Post your comments down below. Ask any questions. We'll try to get Malcolm to respond to them if, if we can. But let us know what you thought about it and just enjoy it. I hope that you do, uh, do as much as I did um, chatting to Malcolm. That you've written is a bestseller. Um, Tipping Point was kind of a breakout book for a lot of people that, uh, for me personally, that kind of changed the way that I, I saw books and, and looked at the world. But what is it that really excites you? What is it that gets you out of the bed in the morning? Is it the fact that you're an acclaimed international author? Is it the fact that a, a young kid understands your concepts? Is it um, getting a, a great story? Um, what is it that really kind of gets you going and gets you excited? Um, I think just um, curiosity about things. Um, the knowledge that there's um, many, many things I don't know and that would be uh, fascinating to learn about, fun to learn about. Uh, I don't know if it's any different today than it ever was. I mean, I feel like the same thing gets me out of bed now than got me out of bed when I was a 10-year-old going to school. Uh, it seems, seems like the same feeling. Okay. And, and, and what is it that you're most proud of? Is it an article that you've written in a book, or is it just a, it's, it's, uh, stories that you've been able to piece together? Well, what has been the highlight? Um... It's funny because I don't really have, I never think of it as, I don't think of it as being, as my career as being a series of um, specific accomplishments. I just think of it as one long process. So I don't really have a highlight. I mean, I've just enjoyed myself. I mean, I, I've just had a, uh, a continuous um, uh streak of enjoyment, I guess is the rest of it. I mean, you know, it's like, there's no, I don't feel like each book is a kind of mountain that I've climbed and then I, you know, then I put that, I put that accomplishment on my wall. I sort of feel like I've been engaged in thinking and talking to people and writing and it's just, it's a, it's a continuous process that makes me happy. Well, I, I think you're probably one of the, the luckiest people in the world then to, to have that continuous happy enjoyment and is, I think is what everybody's after. Um, if we can talk about art, uh, outliers, um, the whole premise of the book is really kind of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the 10,000 hours rule, um, but more importantly in the environment that people are brought up in. Um, I was fascinated by the, the two real stories of the Chinese rice farmers, which I think was one of your... your um, one of your favorite as well, and the Jewish immigrants. Is it possible if, and I know you've probably been asked to, to talk about this a lot, and I've done it hundreds mm -hmm. of times. Can you just talk us through those two um, parts of the book, please? Yeah. Well, the Chinese rice farmers, I was trying to understand um, uh, why it is that uh, Asians seem to do so well in mathematics compared to other cultures. And I started out by pointing out that mathematics Doing well in mathematics for most of us is a simple function of, of your willingness to work hard. Uh, there's no secret to it. It's if you can focus and be disciplined and put in the hours, you can learn the concepts necessary to grasp things like calculus. And then I sort of wondered, well, is it the case that cultures differ in their attitude towards work? And the striking thing about Asian culture is how much the notion of hard work is celebrated and 
um, more than celebrated. It, how much it, it's at the center of their um, understanding of what it means to be uh, a productive uh, member of society. And that, you know, it's very interesting to think about that um, in the context of rice farming, which has really been the central activity of most, for mo much of the history of places like China. What most people did was they were rice farmers. And rice farming is, is unique among farming in that it's a kind of farming which is all about hard work. It, it, it's infinitely, it requires infinitely more hours than the equivalent kind of farming that that um, my ancestors or yours did in Western Europe in medieval times. Um, uh, so it's sort of fascinating to think about, to wonder if there, um, if the, this is in a case where um, the specific cultural heritage that people have ends up um, inadvertently uh, proving to be incredibly useful in the modern world. You know? uh, so that was that was one. Um, that was why I was so interested in that aspect of, of uh, and then the Jewish immigrant part was, um, I was fascinated by the success of Jewish immigrants in the, in the new world, in America, um, and was particularly interested in telling the story of um, the ways in which the kind of particular cultural legacies they brought to America. And there's many, but one of the most obvious ones was that through sort of sheer chance, many Jewish immigrants had been involved in the garment business in the old world, and they arrived in America um, at precisely the moment when the garment business was the fastest growing, most entrepreneurial, uh, most potentially lucrative, um, most wide open uh, industry in uh, the country. Um, so there's again this lovely case where the skills that you learn um, uh, sort of historically by virtue of your cultural heritage turn out for purest good fortune to be beautifully adapted to the modern world. And that's not the whole explanation for why Jews have done so well in um, the United States and Canada, but it's, it's a big part of it. You know, it's sort of, and that's the sort of thing I was interested in exploring in allies, how much success is this kind of fortunate um, uh, uh, co uh, there is fortunate coincidences, um, these these lucky matches between people's heritages and the um, and the skills that are uh, demanded of the times they live in. And and that was one thing that was quite an, an interesting as well, because you seem to kind of take away or ignore the the effort of the human being themselves. Um, and is that just because it's been covered a lot, it doesn't interest you, and you're saying it's more important to look at the environment because not many people do that? Um, because do you still believe that it takes, the, the, there's a kind of, not innate talent, because I know that you, you feel against that as well, but how much rests on the shoulders of, of the individual themselves as well? I mean, if, obviously an enormous amount, but I think you're right in the sense that I feel we know that. Right, and we talk about it endlessly, and um, you know we don't we don't lack for focus on the individual in Western um, in any many many societies. What we lack, I felt, was a proper understanding of the role of environment and culture. So it was yeah, it was really a question. I was trying to get people to say, all right, all right, yes, if, to succeed, you need to be take responsibility, to be hardworking, to be talented. But let's take a step back and talk about what else has to happen. Okay. And, and something that you um, said once, which I really loved, is you define talent as not an innate um, gift in, uh, within somebody, but rather the desire to practice um, and that it was based on passion, um, which for me I love because that just, and it goes back to kind of the 10,000 hours, it means that anybody can really achieve anything if they if they put their all behind it and, and they do those ten thousand hours. Um, yeah, it it, I, it is. Town's such a weird word, and we use it all the time, and we're never we're not always um, specific enough about what we mean by that word. And I sort of think town is equal parts some kind of innate quality, which is it's true. You know, there are. Um, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, Mozart has an innate capacity for um, music composition and performance that many of us do not, right? That's clearly part of it. But there's another part to talent which isn't about some kind of genetic hardwired ability, but it's about joy. It's about wanting to do something. And it, when I look at very successful people, talented people, I see joy as much as I see some inherent ability. Um, you know, when I look at a great football player, um, I'm impressed by their raw athletic ability. But more than that, you know, when you figure out and see how many hours they spend practicing football, you realize they love the game in a way that most people don't. Mm. And it's very hard for me to figure out where, um, uh, where the talent stops and the, and the, and the love starts. It's clear there's, that what we see in a great accomplishment is some combination of those two things. Um, I, another part of your book that you spoke about, which you start your book off with, was, is, um, and I think is, has kind of changed the way that parents are starting to send their kids to school, is when, when kids are born. Um, yeah. I did a, a, a little exercise on my side because I'm from South Africa and we are crazy about so uh, sorry, soccer and rugby in this country. Um, and we've, our rugby team has been world champions twice and I thought, wanted to look at our rugby players um, and see if it was consistent with the, the ice hockey um, guys. And what I found was, and, and well, what, sorry, what I found was that 50% uh, of the, the, the squad was born between March and July and 70% of them were born in three months being April, May and June. So it's not... Right. It's not the first of Jan, but there's definitely something there. Um, well, it depends when... Yeah, the system only... Remember, this whole argument only works if there is a youth development, um, a very, very strong system of developing young people that, that um, has sort of all-star teams at an early age and a, an age cutoff where that, that, that all-star teams are organized around. You have yeah. to have those components in place. Yeah. So I need to know what, what's the age cutoff for age class uh, rugger, and that would tell us. Okay. Um, well, and, and that's what I just wanted to start investigating, but what, what was interesting about it is it's, it, it runs from the 1st of Jan until um, that's the kind of when the age starts, but most of the players that were, that were born across those three months were from a specific region as well within um, South Africa, which is Joburg, Joburg and, mm -hmm. and Pretoria, which I think you've been to. Um, so I want to look at that, but it was, it was, and that's really what I love about your writing. I think what grips most people is you're able to take um, these really irrelevant, random stories and pull them together and find it in, in slant twine. Um, what is the process that you go through, and do you have kind of like a, just a, a massive documents folder on, on your laptop or a book that you scribbled in different research and stories, or, or do you like a beautiful mind mapping on the wall? Well, how do you do that? Because is it often that you, that, that you just keep a story and, and hold on to it for later? Or, or what is that that you go through? I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I don't really understand it myself. I, I guess I'm a little bit like a magpie. I collect these things. Um, I'm always on the lookout for stories that will help me illustrate complicated topics, ideas. Um, I don't have a kind of formal collection, but I, you know, it's my job to read a lot and collect things. And so I sort of, I do semi-deliberately go about um, and ask the question when I run across an interesting story, huh, you know, is that something that might actually prove useful to me someday? Um, so there is a lot of, you have to spend a fair amount of time and energy um, kind of uh, uh, scrounging around for interesting things. Um, and uh, so that's a good deal of my job is essentially that it's kind of reading and talking to people and collecting stuff and making little notes to myself and squirreling things away so um, that's yeah that's a it's a these things don't happen by by accident um, you, you say that you also write to challenge your own feelings your assumptions and theories um, is there something that you had a, a, a theory about that that you, you went out and researched and challenged and was really surprised or, or shocked by, by what came out? 
Yeah, I guess I've been... Um, so Outliers, or my book Blink, for example, really um, changed my mind about the meaning of prejudice. Uh, I had been someone who thought that particularly racial prejudice was something that we were... Um, we had surmounted. It was in the United States and in many Western countries, it was a thing of the past, and we were really dealing with the kind of residue of it, and that was it. And that book really made me realize, no, that's wrong, that it's a much more powerful and, and insidious force that shapes us, our judgments, even when we don't realize it. Um, in Outliers, I was surprised by the... So things like when I was doing that thing about uh, football and soccer and, and hockey, I was surprised by the size of those kinds of effects, um, about just how much elite systems are a function of arbitrary advantages. That sort of stunned me. I thought that, I thought that the way in which talent is collected is pretty efficient, and I realized it's not efficient um, at all. So yeah, every time I'm motivated to do these books in large part because I do, I'll uncover something, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so different from what I thought. And that makes me think that readers would be interested in having the same um, uh, epiphany as I do. Yeah. And, I mean, and based on what you're saying now as well, you also said where um, America has a great, um, is great at developing the human potential of the top 10% um, and kind of ignoring the bottom 90%. Um, but then you also have the example of the school uh, called KIPP. Um, yeah. Is, is, is that a great example of how to how to break the rule or, or be the exception? Um, yeah. What's exciting about KIPP is that it's a, it's a, in, a, in a, the American context, it is a radical concept to focus squarely on the middle of the curve. Um, KIPP does not pretend to be a school for uh, elite students. You know, in America, we're obsessed with elite students. We have everything in our power to create them most extraordinary facilities and opportunities for people who are very, very talented. Um, that's just one of the particular features of American society. It's very focused on high performers. Um, and Kip says they're indifferent. They, you don't take an exam to get in. It's a lottery. Um, they're, they accept what they've been given and they say, we're just trying to get everyone in our system to perform to their uh, best potential. Um, and I'd love to see a lot more of that. I think that um, it's time for America to say, you know what, we do everything necessary. We've done a great job of, of providing for the top part of the distribution. Let's focus on the middle. Let's, let's see if we can provide opportunities for ordinary kids who want to do better, okay, who are willing to work hard. I, lo I love that notion of, the, of focusing on the ordinary kid. And I actually wanted to ask you um, this, and I don't know how much thought you've given it, um, but I, I have this um, personal feeling that our education system, or particularly in South Africa, South Africa's got one of the worst in the world, unfortunately, um, but education all around doesn't really prepare the person properly for, for the world. Um, when I read your book, The Tipping Point at 20, I was like, man, why don't they have this kind of stuff in school? Why can't we learn this? Um, why can't we be challenged to think differently? Um, and there's so much out there currently that we have access to that schools are just kind of being left behind in my personal view. So maths is important and all of that. But have you ever given a thought to if, if you could design kind of the, the ultimate kind of school? What kind of content or how you would teach kids or... or, or uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I thought a little bit about that. I do think that um, and I think we're moving in this direction. I think that uh, the that school uh, teaching um, learning should be a lot more cross disciplinary from an early age. Um, I think it's probably a mistake in the modern world to educate to make these kinds of strict uh, mental divisions between subjects among subjects. Um, you know the the thing about my books is that they're, they're about sociology, they're about psychology, they're about history, they're about all these things, because I don't see a distinction between them. I sort of feel I can tell you one story and I can teach you things from all those different perspectives. 
And I think that's why they appeal to people. And I think schools should do that. I mean, they, I, if I, so if I was doing a school, I would love to teach a class where I took a single story, historical story, uh, and teach it from five or six different perspectives. Um, you know, I'd love to teach a course on the Second World War and just do a talk about everything from the physics of airplanes to military tactics to what happens to somebody psychologically when they go through a battle to the politics of the different countries, you know, to what Hitler was like and how weird he was mm -hmm. to anti-Semitism to, you know, you could, you could spend an entire year just using that one extraordinarily powerful and fascinating story to shine a light on a thousand different things. I mean, can you imagine how kind of cool, what if we organized, what if we took a year of high school and taught nothing in the Second World War, right? Yeah. And had everybody chip in, every single discipline chipped in and used, we could do physics just about, you know, remember the Germans developed V2 rockets at the end of the war? That's, you know, the whole subject, we could do a whole class of physics that just talks about weapons, right? And people wouldn't even realize they were learning physics, right? We could sneak it by them. <laughs> so, I mean, there's actually, we could be, we ought to be, the problem is we've gotten so obsessed with tests and trying to measure everything very precisely that we've given up the opportunity to be really creative in the way we teach things. Um, you know, I would, you know, we could expand it. We could have a high school where every year we just taught one story, right? Uh, maybe the, um, you know, maybe the first year is a different, not a battle, but something else. The, maybe the first year is, is, if it's in South Africa, it's the story of apartheid. Yeah. How it started, why it started, and then use that as a jumping off point to, to examine things five, from five different perspectives. Um, uh, you know, you can, just in describing, um, democracy is on one level a, a course in mathematics, right? Mm. Question of how do you represent people as numbers and systems and make them and create balanced representation and do, you know, so you can see how um, in every one of these complex stories there are multiple opportunities. Um, and I, I see you are fairly excited about this. Um, so when we set something up, we're going to give you a call um, to come and do it. You'll, you'll be our um, VIP professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, storytelling is obviously very powerful. Um, and you're, we're hearing a lot more and seeing a lot more where um, brands and companies are starting to sell, tell stories and, and evolve. Um, do, do you see this growing even further, or is this just kind of a, a, a something that's just happening and is around and people need to get to grips with, or is, or is, this, a, um, is this a proper, I don't know what I'm trying to say, um, is, is, is exactly like you're saying now with, with education um, and how we've seen with games and gamification and that, are we trying? Are, are we going to get into space where we are able to sim simplify things and make it more easily digestible um, in all aspects of life? Um, and is storytelling kind of crucial to that and at the center of that? I hope so. I mean, I think that one of the great uh, promises of the internet is how it can, um, you know, this whole notion now that. Uh, you can, uh, if we have great teachers or great storytellers, through the internet, everybody can watch them. Mm. And so teaching becomes transformed. Teaching becomes about one-on-one -on -one encounters, but lectures or general lectures at the best are really just that storytelling. That kind of storytelling, we can have the best storytellers in the world reach everybody. Um, and then we can use the teacher in the classroom to play a different function to be a, be a much more of a tutor yes. than a, uh, like that's one small example, and that's happening right now, that's the direction education seems to be going. But that does suggest to me that because storytelling is hard, right, it's very difficult to do well, and the great promise of the internet is it allows us to give everyone access to the top, to the best. Um, and so that's, I do think there's gonna be a move in that direction. Mm. Um, and, and so, do you have a favorite story? Um, it's something that 
um, you, you've read in the last couple of years or that you have as a kid or something that just um, really, and, and you probably do have that, but something that epitomizes the, the, the best story that you've heard or read. Yeah. Funny, well, I have a new book coming out, which is going to be called David and Goliath. And it starts with the biblical story of David and Goliath. And, you know, biblical stories are amazing stories. They're, they're so much of what we do is, is a kind of, um, stories we tell are, in many cases, elaborations or um, uh, versions of biblical stories. Um, so I've been sort of fascinated by the kind of power and beauty and simplicity of some of those um, central biblical narratives. Um, uh, so that's the kind of, I mean, the story of David and Goliath by itself is just an extraordinary, incredibly powerful story that we've been sort of wrestling with ever since, right? And we use, constantly reference those terms. Yeah. It's been embedded in our society. Um, and then, um, and then for my new book, actually, I've gotten a lot, I'm really into stories about these confrontations between the weak and the strong. And they're incredibly powerful and fascinating. Um, and we keep coming back to them. We can't get enough of those kinds of asymmetrical confrontations. When, when you told me that you had a new book out, I, I just, I pretty, you couldn't see my face. It just lit up and I got very excited there. Um, Still a year away. Still a year away. A year away. All right. Well, we'll be counting the days. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, I'm just interested in what happens when the powerful and the weak uh, clash. Okay. Um, how do those conflicts work? Why don't they turn out the way we think they're going to turn out? Um, do we get them right? Do we, do we accurately, you know, uh, conflicts between the strong and the weak, we call them that because we have things that we call that we identify as strength and things we identify as weak. Are those categories accurate? Um, that's a really big uh, right. question. Um, uh, if I see David and Goliath and I say David's the underdog and Goliath is the favorite, why do I think that? Um, if, I, if I see Nelson Mandela uh, fighting apartheid and I say he's the underdog and the white establishment of South Africa is the, is the favorite. Why do I think that? What made me think that he's not as powerful as they are? I mean, that, that's the sort of stuff I'm yeah. playing with, trying to kind of get to the root of our understanding of advantage um, and to kind of uh, challenge it a little bit. And, and so what does an average day for you look like then when you're writing or preparing for a book? Because I know that you say that you don't, you're not a routinized uh, person. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of writing is about logistics, sadly. It's not about writing. <laughs> it's about trying to set up the writing. Um, writing is the easiest, least time-consuming part of my, of my job, of my life. Um, so mostly my days are figuring out what to write, figuring out who to talk to so that I can write something, figuring out, you know, just, um, you know, really boring stuff. Like there's some... There's a couple of people for this chapter I'm working on now I really want to write, I uh, want to talk to. They're hard to track down. They're, it's hard to get on the schedule. It's hard to, you know. Um, there are, uh, uh, there's a woman I knew you need to talk to for this, another chapter. She lives in Winnipeg. Um, you know, Winnipeg's a long way away. <laughs> got to go there, got to, you know. There's all this kind of, got to talk prepare for the interview, interview her, think about the interview, interview her, transcribe the interview, think about the transcription of the interview. You know, this, that takes 10 times longer than actually writing right. a little section. Okay. So it's a lot of, and it took me weeks to figure out whether I wanted to talk to her. Was she the right person to talk to? Would her story fit? You know, so it's like, that's a lot of, a lot of what writing is, is this kind of trial and error and, and uh, preparation. Okay. Um, I've in my research when I was when I was trying to find as much, a little bit more out about you, um, I did come across that there were some people that you give you a little bit of um, I don't know if this is a South African word or if you'll understand it, flack. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah right, cool, cool. Um, which um, my mom always used to tell me that the tallest trees gather the what um, catch the most wind, um, but. 
does it even and my question is really kind of have you ever kind of written something where you've actually gone a few years later and said oh you know maybe that isn't the point maybe I was a little bit off there um, but does it even matter because for me my outtake is really that your writing is more about getting people to to question things to think look at things differently to offer a different perspective and to not just take everything that's thrown at them as they normally take so it's a two-part question is is have you and, and the first part doesn't even really matter but is it more about getting people to question it versus looking at it and saying actually maybe I was off there well I think both the things you said are correct so I think it's very important for writers like myself to take chances and that means that sometimes you take a chance and it doesn't work you fall on your face and sometimes I fall on my face I write things that in retrospect uh, I learn a lot after they come out. I think, oh, you know what? I probably oversimplified that or overstated that or took a turn here and I should have taken a turn there. So you, it's, critics are very important. Even when they're nasty, they're very important. They do, you learn something. Every time you write something, you learn something that hopefully helps you the next time. So I welcome, it's difficult sometimes when someone mm -hmm. really goes after you, but I'm glad they do um, because I'm a better writer for it. Um, and then the second part is also true as well, that um, I'm trying to provoke people, not in an irritating way, or a, um, but in a kind of profound way. I want people to re-examine what they believe. And I don't want them, I'm not trying to convert them to my position. I'm trying to make them think. I'm fine if you read my books and don't agree with me. Um, but I'd like... I, all I want is you to do is, at least for a moment, to consider the possibility that um, things might be different than you thought. And if I get you to do that, I've won. Um, and I feel I've gotten a lot of people to do that. Um, but you don't have to be, look, my views on the world are kind of weird and wacky. I don't, you know, I don't want, I'm, if everyone agreed with me, it would be boring. Um, <laughs> but I do, you know, I, can I... If I can just get people to move a couple of degrees in one direction, even for a couple of years, a couple of moments, then, I've, then I'm happy. And that kind of leads me into, uh, I've got uh, two more questions from that, is that you're, pro you're, you're, you're a very open-minded individual. Um, are there things that irritate you, frustrate you about society, about people that you just wish that, like there's one thing that you wish that they would stop doing and the world would be a better place? Yeah, I think people, um, I think the disagreement gets personal too quickly. Um, you know, it's not, because I disagree with you doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Um, which is like a, something that we're told as six-year-olds. Um, but it's, it's amazing how often we forget that. Um, the internet is, my problem with a lot of commentary on the internet is that it's, Everything's personalized. Why is it personalized? Um, uh, that's I would I would love if if discussion was a little more civil. Um, I'd like it to be more intellectually spirited and less personal. I mean, I want people to, you know, don't sugarcoat it. Come after me, but just don't come after me as a person. Come after me for my ideas. Um, uh, that's one thing. Um, and I wish people would were more willing to be wrong. Um, and it sort of goes with the first thing. Take chances. Uh, and feel free to say when you're wrong, I was wrong. Um, that's fine. I'm actually happy when people... Um, I don't think it's a crime to be wrong, and even a crime to be wrong a lot. Um, I think it's a crime to pretend that you're not wrong. And it's a crime never to take... Uh, the chance, never to do anything so risky that you, that you take the chance of being wrong. To be, just to be incredibly predictable and safe in the way that you think, that's the problem. That doesn't get us anywhere. Um, oh, you, you, you've got quite a decent um, career and, and, and you're, you're far from finished, but are there any important lessons that you've learned um, being a writer um, that, that you think are um, profoundly important um, that you can share with us? Or even, not even profoundly, but, but are important to know? Well, there's some really simple ones. I think that, 
And it doesn't just apply to writers. I think people shouldn't, people who create things shouldn't be in a hurry. The most important thing I've learned as a writer over the course of my career is to slow down. Um, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Um, if you have, you know, don't let anyone, it so happens, often happens with writers that there's pe other people impose arbitrary deadlines on them. And so you rush something, you do three drafts when you should have done ten, you, you forget that high quality things take a lot more time than average things. And so make sure you have enough time to do the high quality thing. Um, like, it's weird to talk about time management as being, and patience as being central, but they're central to everything that's good, um, I think, uh, is you give yourself a chance to kind of ruminate on something, you know? It's like, um, not everything has to be done instantaneously. And, and how much of that is um, the writer's, um, con in the writer's control and in the publisher's control? Um. Well, I mean, it's a little bit of both. The writers have to make sure that they discipline themselves so they leave themselves enough time. And publishers have to be, have to acknowledge, I think, that speeding things up too much imposes a cost okay. on the quality. Um, the, uh, I'm going to ask you a question now just about publishing because publishing is obviously changing and, and anyone can now upload a book onto Amazon um, and self-publish and all these ebooks and it's changing the way that people consume books. How does that affect someone like you as an as a author and as a writer? And, and, and has it changed your view of what you're going to be doing in the future or, or is it just no. kind of... It hasn't changed anything that I do. Uh, I don't mind. I'm indifferent to how someone reads my work, whether they're um, on a Kindle, on an iPad, on a on a on a physical book, on a on a book on whether I'm, they're listening to me read it on you know on a on an audio book. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. Whether they come to hear me speak, um, I'm in the business of reaching people with my thoughts, and doesn't matter to me. Um, how they choose to receive me. I just would like to be listened to. Okay. Um, I've got a quick question for advice to young writers. Um, and I've read somewhere before that you've said that most young writers give up before they hit the 10,000 hour mark, um, halfway through there. What is your mm. advice to young writers? Um, and part of that question as well, and I don't know if it's a separate question, is what would your advice be to an 18 year old version of Malcolm Gladwell? It would be it would be to think of what you're doing as um, what you understand is going to take you your entire 20s to get good. That's the starting thing. That you're not, you're, you're, you're just as a, no one goes to medical school expecting on the second week of medical school to be able to do brain surgery. Um, writing, because it appears so much easier, we think, oh, you should be able to master it quickly. No, it's every bit as hard as brain surgery. So look at look at when people are go out on their own as brain surgeons. They're what are they? They're 33, 34. Well, you should have the same expectation. Um, that's one thing. And also, but that's not a bad thing. I mean, the process by which you teach yourself how to be a good writer is really, really fun. I mean, it's insanely fun. Um, you know, you kind of you get to st the idea of doing something where you can witness yourself improve keep improving year after year after year. It's just, that's, that's the, that's, it's just, there's so much joy in that. Um, so that's the first thing I guess I would tell them. And then the second thing I would say is that um, you should write about what you, you care about. Um, you know, no matter how nerdy or narrow it seems, what people respond to in writing is passion. Um, they don't, people think they're only interested in three things. They're not. People are interested in everything, um, so long as it is communicated with joy, with interest, you know? We can smell a fake. The thing that all readers can do is smell a fake a mile away. If you're faking it, you're finished. Right? That's the thing. And we can also smell genuine passion a mile away. And passion is intoxicating. Um, it's the most exciting thing in the world. Um, and if you can deliver that to people, you'll always be successful. 
But that advice is so liberating because it just it, it keeps people true to who they are and, and it, it, um, they can't go wrong with that. Um, I yeah. wanted to ask you, um, what resources do you use to, um, and I can say the word, uh, the phrase, to keep um, give you the edge or to keep you um, kind of peaking or at 100% or, or what do you use to stimulate? You obviously consume a lot of material, but are, are there people that you go to for intellectual stimulation or books you read or things you look at or, or what do you do? Just, there's no formula. I mean, I try to expose myself to a lot of interesting people. I try to read very widely, deliberately read things that I wouldn't normally think I was interested in. Um, go to the library a lot. Uh, get lots of sleep. <laughs> get lots of there's sleep. No, yeah. There's no mystery to it. It's just, just be kind of, um, but you have to kind of formally um, uh, open yourself up to the world. That's the key thing. And, and any of your greatest books that you can recommend? Oh, it's such an impossible question because I just love so many books. Um, it's all about what I'm reading now. I'm right now reading lots of books on the American Civil Rights Movement, and um, they're fascinating to me. I mean, um, uh, but I, 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 the list of books that have challenged and inspired me is in, in the hundreds by now, so there's no, there's no one I can point to. Uh, how many books do you think you have read? Oh, I mean, thousands. Uh, I have no way of counting them. I mean, I suppose I read at least a couple a week, two, three a week. Okay. Uh, uh, some weeks more. Um, going back since I was a kid, so I don't even know what that adds up to. And do you have an e-reader or do you read a... a, a the, I like to read, I tend to read on real books. I like to mark books up with a pen. Yeah. Keep them in my library and they're big form. My brain is really represented in my library. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I like to highlight my books as well. So, so all the books are highlighted and then I got a Kindle and then I started using that and highlighting the Kindle. But then what I realized now was that you can't highlight too much in a Kindle because it obviously thinks that you're copying it. So I've got a few books that I've highlighted that there's all this data that's lost and now I'm peeved at Kindle and I'm going to start complaining to Amazon. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But uh, what, do you th what goes through your brain when you're not actively working and you're maybe walking to the library or in the shower? I would, I would love to see what goes on in, in, in your brain and, and, and the stories that are happening what you're thinking about. Is there any chance that you can give us or open your brain up just for, for a second on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's very, it's just incredibly varied. I, it depends whether I'm working on something that's sort of problematic or whether I'm daydreaming about my book or I'm thinking about, you know, friends and loved ones or it's just as, I just think that it's important. I try to set aside time for that kind of daydreaming. You know, I don't, when I go running, I don't wear an iPod because I want to, enjoy my thoughts. I don't want to be interrupted. Um, I try to make sure that I eat one meal a day by myself so I can sit and think. And um, So all those kinds of things. I build in time for daydreaming. But, the, but I, don't, I don't try and... What I daydream about differs, you know, um, every day. But it's just a, it's a matter of kind of um, leaving myself open to that kind of... Uh, Free range thinking. All right, and and so is is it more kind of um, an abstract process where it's it's free range, or is there a little bit of formula that you've gained over the years as well, where you try and look at things from different angles, or or look at it from from the opposite side, or you ask specific questions when you're looking at a situation? Well, I just I mean I just wonder. I'm just basically asking the question: How interesting is that? How unusual? How weird? How? Um, uh, does it lead anywhere? Is it a kind of? Does it does it connect me to some other thought? Um, those are all the kinds of. Uh, is there a story attached to it? Is there? Those are all the kinds of questions that I ask myself when I run across something. Um, is there anything weird about you or a personal quirk or something that you're compulsive about or obsessive about that that makes you different to to other people? No, I'm really boring and normal. 
<laughs> there's got to be something now because I interview a few people and I always ask them this and it's from one guy who says he's obsessive about wine gums um, which is a sweet here, here in South Africa um, is there anything like that? no Mary I really am kind of normal and boring I mean I'm a big runner yeah I suppose I'm obsessive about exercise okay. um, I don't really Gladwells are very 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 normal we're there is no we're we're not extreme people at all. We're you know my father would go to work and come home and garden and walk his dog and then would repeat that day every day for fifty years. Uh, you know they're not we're not people who are um, uh, we're not eccentric in slightest. I'm the least eccentric person. Really? Um, yeah. yeah I'm not, I mean, I'm a little bit solitary, but that's, you know, a necessary part of my job, I guess. Um, and w with your running, how often do you run and, and what kind of distances do you do? Um, so well, I'm an old man now, so I don't run like I used to, but I run, I run uh, every other day, six miles, that kind of thing. Yeah. Try to run under seven minute miles. Well, wow, okay. Um, where I live in Cape Town, we have one of the most beautiful running tracks that's uh, along the, the sea and, and the cliffs. It's called the Seapoint Promenade. So if you ever come down to Cape Town, um, go for a run there. Um, All right. <laughs> um, is it true that you drive a VW Golf? GTI. Yeah, I'm really? a big car guy. Okay. So I, I have, I'm, very, I'm very, fan, very, very fond of my little GTI. I was in the shop right now, which is disturbing me. What, what happened to it? I just didn't, I didn't, a friend of mine borrowed it and it didn't start, I think it's the alternator, but oh, okay. uh, I'm very, it's a, it's a great little car. Okay, that's great, because you said that you're more fascinated, fascinated by that car than a Ferrari, um, because the challenge is, is a lot higher to build something like that at that cost price. Um, oh yeah, like a great, a great $30,000 car is vastly more interesting than a great $100,000 yeah. car. Um, and um, cars get too... The problem is, the fancy cars are too convoluted, and they're not, there's no simplicity to them, you know? It's like, I want a car with a key that I stick in the lock, and with a stick shift, and with, it doesn't have, you know, 900 little gadgets and gizmos built into them. I, I absolutely agree. I wish I could show you a, a photograph of my car. It's a, a VW Golf um, City. Oh, you too? Yeah, as well. Um, because I just need a car from A to B, and I can't, uh, it kills me to pay money for, for a car that, that um, does stuff that you don't need and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. So I was really excited um, that you, you did the same. I'm going to start wrapping up now. I've, I've got a few quick questions um, left, but um, I wanted to ask you, you've been interviewed hundreds of thousands of times. Um, what questions do you hate getting asked, and what question do you wish you would get asked? Oh, uh... Or is that one of the questions you hate getting asked? No, no, no. I don't know what I hate getting asked. I sort of, you don't hate questions. You hate, hasty is trying to work, but sometimes you don't like the person interviewing you. But if you like the person interviewing you, there's no such thing as a bad question. Um, it's more about the kind of, a uh, uh, interview is a, is a little mini relationship. You know, it's about, um, do you trust the person? Do you like the do you have a good feel for their motives, that kind of thing. Um, questions, I wish I was, you know, the questions you want to be asked about are the stuff that no one, that are irrelevant, you know, I mean, I'd love to talk about, you know, track and field for an hour and a half, um, or cars, but no one really is interested in my views on cars and track and field, so. <laughs> well, are you looking forward to the Olympics coming up? I am very much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what the, okay, I got two more questions. This next question is, is quite deep, and, and, and I'm gonna ask it because it, it, you can kind of uh, not, um, tell something about a person. But what is what do you believe is the meaning of life? Um, the, the thing, what is this all about? Um, what, you know? Well, I mean, I just think we. Are, I mean, that's a, obviously a huge. Yeah. Um, I think our our responsibility is to try and leave the world a little bit better. Then we found it. I mean, it's a very trite thing to say, but I think that that says it all, right? I mean, you at the end of the day, you should be a positive force um, uh, and net positive. Um, 
And you can do that in a million different ways. Uh, and that's within the power of everybody on the planet. Um, so I think that's the sim probably the simplest way to say what life is about. Um, my, my final question is um, to ask you, who do you think I should interview next? Um, and what do you think I should ask them? Oh, goodness. What an interesting question. Um, uh, wow. I have no idea. Um, so many, uh, so many, there's so many possibilities. I mean, I guess I would interview somebody, um, I'd interview somebody who, I, I, I'd, I'd be curious to interview someone who was good at some very, very, very specific thing and get at this question of, of passion, about how much of their talent is actually passion. That would be a really interesting thing to explore with somebody. Um, they, you know, someone who did something very, very narrow, um, not something grand, something very specific, and sort of t walk them through their motivation. That would be really interesting. All right. Good. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Thank you.